Or, well, you can, but you won't be This is the day we got stuck in the lift. What do you have to say, ma'am? What's your name? My this name is. is oh, it's yeah. oh, my name is Jaja. I'm heavy chef organizing this, organizing this marvelous event with President Tabo Mbaki. But yes. yes. Sorry, guys. GD calls. Hello. I'm fine. 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 I'm I'm still laughing at the person outside. Like, what button must I Guys, press? may I suggest that somebody phones the Schindler Aren't you supposed emergency to be line? Stage? Yeah, I'm practicing my speech right now in my head in the lift. And she's going to deliver sure it to I've the seven of us. Just to make sure that you can do it in the great cool. practice round, yeah. I mean, after this, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. <laughs> and then, why are you here? In, <laughs> in the name of the phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ready? Tell me when you're ready. Okay, I'm Fred, the CEO of Heavy Chef. I'm in a lift with Sam and Sun Kobe, uh, and uh, we're stuck. We're stuck here. We're supposed to be on stage upstairs on the 18th floor. We are currently on the 17th floor and the 16th. And the 16th. So somewhere in between there. We're not 100% sure. They are busy trying to open the doors right now. But we thought, you know what, let's just take the opportunity just to get the festivities going and actually ask some, some questions of our two speakers. But I Fred, before you go there, like you've mentioned that we're stuck, but I actually don't feel we're stuck at all. What do you, don't what you, do you feel, feel we are? That we're kind of liberated, <laughs> we're liberated from the expectations of the evening. <laughs> yes. That was thrust upon we got, us and we now. Got off, we got off. And now, we got off. Okay. Now, we're, now we're free. This is going from education to philosophy in, in about 20 minutes. So I, I'm very happy about that. We, we, we are exactly free from all the duties and responsibilities and now we kind of pretty much add living as we go. Yeah. Yeah. So so then with that in mind and the spirits of ad living, so Corbe, I'm going to start with you. Um, can you give us a little bit of a, a, a gist of what you, you're going to speak about later on tonight? Sure, so a gist of what I was going to speak about tonight and hope to still speak about tonight is effectively just kind of breaking down what the fourth industrial revolution is and trying to make it practical to people and trying to make it less so about the technology but more so about what it means for us as human beings and trying to apply that into the education space and specifically what does that mean in the preschool space as well as the basic education space because how we're doing things is definitely not stuff that's aligning with where we are at the moment and the big thing for me is the grade one students that are in our schools this year finish matric in 2030 and that means that we need to be preparing them for a world that we don't really know what it looks like and we haven't even started Wow, that's, that's, big that's deal, really man. good. Wow. That's a big deal. I mean, I think that's one of the most important. We have a round of applause from our audience. Well done. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. That's so well. Yes. That's, right. that's a pretty good talk, actually. Yes. So there's about 300 tough people. Crowd. Tough crowd. 300 yeah, there's, people in There's our... about 300 people who are missing out on a pretty <laughs> fundamentally important talk. So I want to give the mic over to my man in Amsterdam. Well, thank yes. you so much, Fred. Sam Paddock. Uh, and ask him just a little bit of a, a, a snippet of what we can expect later on tonight. Super. So what I also want to say up front is that um, it, who was it? Was it Winston Churchill? No, it was Mark Twain who said like, didn't have time to write a uh, short letter, so I wrote a long one. Well, tonight yes. in this lift, we're being forced to right. microsize short the messages <laughs> we want to um, uh, to share with people. I think that's a really interesting format. Yeah. I'm not sure Beautiful. that anyone would have dreamt it up before we got stuck in this lift. I think we have a YouTube channel in the making right here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Heavy chef, like it's stuck in the lift amazing. sessions. Yeah. Yes. The logo's, even got, the logo's even got smaller to HC now. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to mention the visual. It's going to be HC <laughs> Mama. That's what it's going to be. That's what's going to be. HC sessions. Yeah. This is episode one HC sessions. This is proper what credibility, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, it's accidental pain. Right. With that, with that nonsense out the way. Um, <laughs> in fact, that was the direction. Focus point. Like, now I'm about to get to nonsense. Yeah. Um, my uh, so, so, I really enjoyed that um, the view of um, of giving people a working definition for the fourth industrial revolution because I feel like in so many ways what we have is like a lot of a lot of noise um, and and not enough like like solid narrative and it's exactly the same thing that I'm looking to do with this topic of future of education in Africa. It is an enormous topic. Like 
And, and, I, and, I, and what I do is I examine the topic through a series of lenses. One is just the classic lens of strategy, which, uh, which we don't have time to go into now. But when you break it down, you realize that this is an enormous topic across five to 25 year olds, across 54 countries, exponentially more cultures. And then you overlay all the products and just the categories of products, early childhood development, primary school, yes. secondary school, tertiary, and the layers in tertiary for continuing education. So you've got these layers. And so my first argument is that we shouldn't be talking about education at all. At all. We should dismiss, we should literally stop talking about education, this catch-all excuse for accountability bucket of education. We should yeah, be talking brother. about the job to be done. And yes. what I do is I introduce the theory. Um, the job to be done theory is very pragmatic and what it asks is that whether you're government or whether you are in the private sector, you offer products or services yes. and customers choose to hire your products and services into their lives to do a job for them. Yeah. Mm. And it's a very pragmatic way of thinking about it because when we think about problems like education, we can ask ourselves, well, who is the consumer, who is the customer, and what job are they hiring this education product into our lives to do for them? Um, and, and, and it's my contention that we should be very clear about the jobs that we wish to do. We should dismiss this term of education and we should be clear. If it is that we want to take privileged kids and turn them into the future leaders of this country, let us say, say that. that. If we want to take unemployable 18 year olds and make them mm -hmm. employable, let us say that. If we're looking to help mothers who have to travel 20 kilometers to the domestic work every day and leave their kids at childcare, not education, let us say that just so we can start from a base level of understanding of accountability and if we can be clear about that we can be accountable about the, what we're going to have our leaders held accountable mm -hmm. to but more than that we're going to take what is currently a bundled good in education mm -hmm. and we're going to unbundle it and we're going to understand the component parts that we can scale solutions because let's be clear by the year 2100 there will be four out of every ten people in the world will be african yeah but we're all going to be dead by then. Not tonight because we're safe in the lift. But then but we will be yeah, dead. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take it a little bit further, a little bit closer to home. Stats SA data crunched by Clem Center, the global um, uh, scenario planner, uh, has us in 2030 educating uh, okay. 26 Sorry. million Sorry. people. Yeah. Yes. This is wonderful. So <clears throat> um, uh, that brief interlude, <clears throat> um, after that brief interlude, what I wanted to say was pull that forward. like. 82 years extrapolating out is almost nonsensical for us. We can't think that far because we're not going to be around. Mm. But uh, what I want to talk about is 2030, which Sonkoba also, also spoke about earlier. And I think for me, 12 years away, we're going to have 26 million new job seekers, not in Africa, but in South Africa. Mm. And the big question is, are we going to harness the potential of this population and rise as an African continent? Or are we, on the other end of that, um, on that continuum, are we going to deal with any manner of humanitarian crises. Mm. And it is up to us to consider how to do that. And I have this proposition which I hope to share with everyone tonight, which it speaks of a audacious, digital-first, people-driven solution to education. Um, and if we get into it, it'll be lovely to discuss it with everyone um, because it'll give us something to, to tie back to some sort of uh, proposition. We need to be pragmatic and practical about these things, and that's what we're hoping to achieve tonight. Um, give people practical tools to talk about it together, because the best things happen when people rub minds. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I, uh, one last question then for me, for both of you, and maybe just start with you, on Robert, sure. about the fact that everyone's talking about how the fourth industrial revolution is disrupting everything. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is true, uh, and is? If it is true, then is that really a challenge or an opportunity, or is it somewhere in between? And maybe just a comment on that. Sure. So I, I think it's a really good question because a lot of the conversations about fourth industrial revolution are driven on fear, right? So it's everyone's yes. going to lose their job in the next so many years. The reality is that that's barely true. Um, in studies that have literally tried to take people's jobs, break them down into specific tasks that are required, it's actually tasks that are being annihilated and repetitive tasks that are being removed from the world, which actually, for most jobs, there's no way that 100% of your job is a repetitive task. Actually, what it is, is that technology is freeing us up to think and do better at the things that require thought and intense process and freeing us up and away from the things that are repetitive that a computer can do better than us with better accuracy than us but without kind of intuition so that means that there's specific skills that we need to harness that only human beings can harness and robots can't and some of those skills are what we need to focus on some of those skills are around kind of intuition, it's around creativity, it's around imagination, it's around problem solving, it is around kind of giving instruction to robots and to computers to do the things that we need them to do. But it's also about solving problems with context. 
Because if you gave a computer the problem of poverty to solve, it probably could solve it. If you gave a computer the problem of land distribution in South Africa to solve, it would solve it. Would it solve it the best way given the context of our country and given the context of the problem that we're trying to solve? Probably not. And that's actually a layer that only human beings can apply to whatever is happening. So I think it's an opportunity to focus on the stuff we need to focus on. It's an opportunity to get away from the stuff that can actually be done better than we do it and focus on the stuff that we do well. And I think that there's also the notion that like every time there's a new technology, we over estimate the type of impact it will have mm. every time in mm. the short term mm. right and we underestimate kind of real impact in the long term so there's kind of this panic going on about in the next two years there'll be robots walking mm. around and we won't have homes and we won't have jobs and it's not probably going to play out that way it actually is going to be something we shape and get involved in and i think for me the big thing is that as africans we aren't behind the scenes of creating this revolution the reality is something as simple as Googling a googling cute baby gives something that doesn't look like what Africans look like. And the reality is that it means that we're not part of the creation process, and we're not part of the process of driving the fourth industrial revolution. So it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us not to bother with the third industrial revolution. It's an opportunity to get on with it and find solutions that work a lot quicker than what it is that we're still trying to achieve at the moment. It's actually an opportunity to ditch that which we're trying to build up to slowly but surely and use new technologies like what Sam's talking about to effectively move on to the next era. Of course. You. Go. So I just think that it is, it, the fourth industrial revolution really is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to actually find and achieve more potential in the people that we have as citizens of South Africa as well as the continent. But it does require us to get involved, to actually experiment with some of the stuff that's happening, but also use it to shape and solve problems that we have. And this notion that everything's going to come to an end, everything's going to be automated, and it's a pessimistic view, which is understandable because it comes from a place of fear. But as soon as you start kind of trying to solve practically some of the issues that you have that you're facing using the technology that's available it actually makes your life better so um, as a very simple example for a lawyer who needs to read reams and reams of paper of case study if there is a computer that can summarize that for them or advise them on how best to argue a case that lawyer hasn't lost their job in fact they're more productive and are able to argue more cases and actually help more people that actually need their services yeah Good. Nice. Well done. Sam, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, I think it was well said. I would add um, that I think the framing for the fourth industrial revolution for me is the coming together of man and machine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I so just want to touch on that a fair amount. And I think the, the big thing for me is like we're actually emotional beings first. And so when we're confronted with things we don't know, we get like scared yes. yeah. like and and the result is that you kind of like you just wig out and and, um, and people don't really know what's going on um so it's worthwhile like sifting through mm -hmm. the noise to ask yourself the question like what do we actually know mm -hmm. um and there's a couple of things that i think we actually know i think we know that uh, mach machines computers and um, as some probably has has kind of illustrated through examples of law and others um they are they're they're gaining in power of course, machines don't just have autonomous power, they're driven by men and women. And so the question is like, actually humans are gaining power through these machines. And so the question is, what does that mean? And it's been hotly debated about AI and what does it mean when AI can kind of manage its own life and, and give birth to itself. And uh, you, know, I'm not, you know, I don't really, I don't really understand that. Uh, what I do understand is that the world's changing faster than it's ever changed before. It means that there will be new opportunities and a lot of disruption to the way we work. Um, and I think, you know, uh, moving away from more manufacturing jobs, which are done by robotics and automation, to service jobs is kind of the theme. But the, first, the, the, the one thing we do definitely know is that there's going to be a lot of change and people need to upskill. Yeah. So, so much so that people are now estimating that at least two hours every week, even for the greatest professionals, will need to be spent reskilling themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's like, there's like a dynamic there, which is that, that the world is undergoing a rapid pace of change and is being driven by increased power. So there'll be increased power in man and machines, and it, man will be um, <clears throat> Like, I mean, for this lift, for example, I mean, what we really want is a <laughs> nice, nice lift. Nice so let's, so let's, so let's, let's use the example of this lift right now. Okay? This lift, this lift is incredibly dumb, right? Yes. Just to be clear, and we all agree. Take, if we take the fourth industrial revolution as and it applies to this lift, let's, let's quickly workshop this problem, right? Absolutely. A, 
it'd be connected to like a hub which would self-diagnose, it fix itself, rectify, Without and we'd be out, we wouldn't even know. No time. In, in the ultimate um, example, what you we have in the airline industry it. is after like 70, 80 years of being in the airline industry, you have error rates gone from 25% crashes when you first started uh, flying down to last year, 210 fatalities out of 1.2 billion air seats booked. Yeah. Like, that's incredible. Yeah. But if you contrast that with the medical profession, last year there was 400,000 preventable deaths in American hospitals. Why? It's a litigious society. Doctors don't want to go into the detail of why they cocked it up. And so what happens is you don't have the feedback loops you need to learn. You can't take a scientific approach to the world. Whereas in the, in the airline industry, that's been happening every time there's a crash. You retrieve the black box and you make it safe for the next time. Yeah. So it's a feedback loop, it's a scientific method. Um, and so that's actually, like I segue to that. Like I think, it, I think the fourth industrial revolution is like, boys, let's go.